Uh, hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to the panel on the world's top economies. Uh, this is part four of the series on imagining a post-COVID world. Uh, I'm Andrea Ferrero. I'm the Levin Fellow in Economics at Trinity College and associated with the Department of Economics. Uh, it's my great pleasure to chair this panel this evening. It's nice to see uh, many of you that uh, haven't had the a fortune to meet, but I'm, I'm glad to meet, although not in person. Uh, we have uh, three very distinguished speakers tonight who are also uh, Trinity Old members. So let me uh, introduce them to you. Uh, we have with us uh, Sandy McKenzie, who is uh, BPE's uh, 1972. Sandy was a member of the economic staff at the International Monetary Fund for over 25 years. After leaving the fund, he was uh, uh, for a while the pension expert at the Public Policy Institute of AARP um, and then the inaugural editor of the Journal of Retirement. He has taught at the University of California's Washington Center and Dallas e University and is the author of several books on, uh, on monograph on pension and related issues. Sandy will talk tonight about the US economy, and in particular, the impact of the pandemic during the past year and other short-term prospects. Then we have uh, with us uh, Joe Horn Patanotai, uh, who graduated in mathematics uh, in 1993. He runs uh, Strategy 613, which is an M&A and strategic advisory firm focused on cross-border investment into and out of Thailand and China. Uh, Joe also runs the Oxford Thai Foundation, which provides scholarship uh, to top Thai students to study in Oxford, and Shanghai Children's Project, which provides a better foundation for educating village children in Southern Yunnan pro uh, province along the China-Myanmar border. Uh, Joe will give us uh, uh, some thoughts on the next normal, uh, given his perspectives of uh, living and working in China and Thailand. And then finally, we have uh, uh, Raul Recchi, who graduated in engineering in 2013. Uh, Raul is a director in investment banking at Lazard, where he advises businesses and governments worldwide on a range of corporate finance, capital markets, and uh, strategic issues. Raul also dire directs Lazard Lab, the firm's uh, Think and Do Tank, uh, for emerging developments in technology and economics. Previously, Rahul was an economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors during the Obama administration, where he focused on public finance, healthcare, and international macroeconomics. He attended Trinity on a Marshall Scholarship and currently serves on the board of the Schuyler Center uh, for Analysis and Advocacy. So uh, Rahul will talk about how the paradigm of economic policy will shift uh, after the COVID crisis. Let me just uh, uh, mention a couple of points about housekeeping. Uh, we'll have uh, each panelist talk for, for about uh, 10 minutes and then we'll open the floor uh, for questions. Um, if you please uh, can uh, uh, type any question you may have into the chat box and then I'll, uh, uh, I'll ask the question to our uh, panelists after uh, the first round. I'll also uh, kindly ask you uh, to set your microphones on mute. Uh, and then I should announce that we'll uh, record the session, but only the speakers uh, and possibly people with their camera on will be uh, recorded, but no names uh, will be uh, displayed uh, in the recording. So uh, without much further ado, uh, let me give the floor to uh, Sandy, who will kick us off for this uh, uh, panel. Sandy, please. Uh, sure. Um... My talk uh, on the U.S. economy is going to have three parts. Uh, in part one, I'm just going to discuss the initial macroeconomic and financial consequences of the pandemic for the U.S. economy in the past year. Then I'm going to turn to the response of economic policy and its consequences and make some further remarks on the pandemic's uh, economic consequences. And then finally, I'll turn to the outlook for the current year, 2021, uh, some uh, discussion of policy with a special emphasis on the current debate over the appropriate stance of fiscal policy. Um, as the seriousness of the COVID-19 pandemic became apparent in the winter of 2020, 
many state governments uh, adopted lockdowns or stay-at-home orders of varying degrees of length and severity. And these policies led almost immediately to a drastic decline in real GDP of almost 10% and an unprecedented increase in unemployment and uh, claims for unemployment insurance. Uh, unemployment and claims have subsequently begun their decline as the economy has begun its recovery, but they remain at historically very high levels. Um, I want to underscore the fact that a basic feature of uh, 2020 was that it was the result of a deliberate decision to constrain supply. It was not the result of collapse uh, of demand as occurred in the Great uh, Depression uh, or in the Great Recession of uh, 2008. So consequently, stimulative demand policies to reverse at least that part of the decline would have been pointless. However, the decline in supply did have knock-on effects that reduced aggregate uh, demand. Um, in the lockdown sectors, basically workers uh, uh, work from uh, paycheck to paycheck, and consequently they had to reduce their expenditure on goods and services produced by the rest of the economy. And there were other depressing influences on uh, expenditure that I will get to subsequently. Turning to the response of fiscal and monetary policy, the uh, stimulus packages passed in the spring of 2020 had two basic purposes. The first was to alleviate the misery of the unemployed and the second was to stimulate aggregate demand. The Federal Reserve was supporting fiscal policy basically by monetizing a large part of the debt and by stepping in to try to prevent the collapse of financial markets. One of the curious effects of the pandemic was a remarkably high increase in the rate of personal saving. In the second quarter, it increased to almost 25% of GDP. It subsequently declined, but it still remains high by historical standards. And this increase resulted from a combination of things. First of all, uh, there was a big increase in personal income uh, resulting from uh, the transfer payments of the expansion of fiscal policy and the fact that uh, this money was not immediately spent, particularly uh, the part of it that was received by high income households. At the same time, in-person shopping declined because people were afraid of contracting the virus. Uh, there was a decline in expenditure, obviously on commuting, like gasoline, for example. And there was perhaps the park precaution, uh, sorry, the possibility of increased precautionary saving. Um, one of the results of all of this was uh, an increase in asset values, uh, both real assets, accepting perhaps parts of the real estate market uh, and financial assets. The stock market in particular after suffering a loss earlier in the year has been basically booming ever since. I would note that deaths from the pandemic have not had a significant impact on potential labor supply because they've been overwhelmingly concentrated among the old, indeed among the oldest of the old. But the pandemic, as you might expect uh, from the unemployment statistics, has had an absolutely devastating impact on the labor market. Uh, it may be scouring uh, the income of young Americans just entering the labor market. Uh, studies of other countries have shown that uh, cohorts uh, entering during a recession have suffered a long-term decline in their income. At the same time, there's been a huge drop in labor market participation of women, probably because they've been staying at home to look after their children. Uh, I'll also note that the um, disparate effect of the pandemic on employment has increased already marked uh, inequalities of income inequality, particularly among African-Americans and Latinos. I'll turn now to the out, outlook for 2021. The Bipartisan Congressional Budget Office projects that actual output should reach its pre-pandemic or end 2019 level by the middle of this year. And they project that the output gap uh, should probably be eliminated by about 2025. Now these projections were made without taking into account the uh, large stimulus package now under discussion. Uh, 
So, so that aside, we can expect that unemployment will remain high for some years to come. Economic policy has basically got to be geared to uh, suppressing the pandemic. It's a sine qua non for economic recovery. Uh, success in controlling the pandemic, in addition to boosting employment, will increase the share of students who are actually back benefiting from in-person learning. That'll benefit their future income and it'll allow their parents to rejoin the labor market, which is very important. Um, I'm not going to discuss the measures uh, needed to control the pandemic, but would simply observe that the devastating impact of the pandemic on residents of nursing homes appears finally to be abating uh, as the vaccination rollout uh, picks up uh, speed. However, uh, the pandemic has revealed that the regulation of nursing homes is really uh, severely lacking and measures have to be taken to deal with it. Um, the pandemic has also laid bare, I'm not sure it really needed laying bare, but it's laid bare the basic uh, inequities of the nation's healthcare system, uh, particularly among Americans of color. This is a moral issue, not just an economic issue, but better health for all would obviously mean a better economy for all as well. As far as the stimulus package is concerned, no one disputes the point that a large package is necessary, but there's some disagreement over how large it should be. Uh, and the chief academic protagonists in this debate are Lawrence Summers of Harvard and the former uh, Secretary of the Treasury on the one hand, and the Nobel laureate uh, Paul Krugman and uh, currently uh, columnist for the New York Times and the other. Larry Summers worries that the package, which is 9% of current GDP, uh, is simply very, very large by comparison with any other uh, stimulus package. And he notes that it's a multiple of the uh, uh, output gap. He is therefore concerned that there's a real possibility of a recrudescence of inflation. Um, other commentators have pointed to the very large increase in the money supply and are concerned about the inflationary impact of that as well. Uh, Paul Krugman, for his part, obviously disagrees. Um, he divides the stimulus package into three parts. The first is the part that would be dealing with the COVID directly. Uh, the second is the part that's needed for relief of the unemployed and their families. And basically the third is all the rest. He argues that parts one and two are simply non-negotiable. He likens them to the ramping up of expenditure in 1942 following Pearl Harbor. Uh, as far as part three is concerned, he concedes that maybe some of the program may be a bit dubious. Uh, some of the stimulative checks of 1600 US dollars uh, may be going to households that don't really need them. On the other hand, some households may benefit from this who've fallen through the cracks of the unemployment uh, system. And bear in mind that uh, unemployment insurance in this country is administered by no less than 51 jurisdictions, the 50 states in the District of Columbia, which is downright crazy. In the UK, it's administered by only one. And in, I think just about any other country. Um, I grant uh, Paul Krugman's point about the non-negotiability of parts one and two, but I would observe that non-negotiable or not, uh, they still have uh, an impact on aggregate demand and that has to be reckoned with. Um, consequently, it's possible that a strong recovery may require that some uh, of the measures be scaled back. A key issue basically is how reversible some of the measures of the pandemic uh, might be. Uh, it's possible that there may be a boom in consumption like that that followed the end of World War II when there was a un, or pent up demand for consumer durables. At the same time, the increase in personal saving that I've commented on uh, may not be entirely reversed if part of it has simply become a habit. So there's a great deal of uncertainty. Um, this has implications for fiscal policy because more saving uh, simply creates more room 
uh, for fiscal, not just fiscal stimulus, but uh, a spending on infrastructure, which this country badly uh, needs. So I'm going to have to conclude on an, on an agnostic note. Uh, I have no very precise recommendations to make, except perhaps that fiscal policy is going to have to be awfully nimble. Uh, and with that, I will await questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. It's a great way to uh, kick us off. Um, so next, uh, we're going to have uh, Joe, uh, who is going to tell us about the next normal, uh, given his perspectives of working in China and, and Thailand. Joe? Thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, give maybe a very short uh, overview of, of what it is that happened really in, in China, as, as well as in Thailand, uh, in these two places. Uh, uh, during the pretty much the entirety of the COVID uh, outbreak. And um, it was, you know, it, it, in many ways, uh, I think, you know, the, the region was, was better prepared for, for uh, an outbreak because of the many outbreaks and the many viruses that we have uh, on a regular basis. So, so when this one came, uh, um, like I was in Thailand at the time that it, of the outbreak, and uh, Thailand actually acted very quickly to, uh, to basically, they had these notches in place already. And so they just cranked things up by a notch. Uh, city, the city went into a you know, uh, more careful mode. Everyone started wearing masks. Um, schools started you know, checking temperatures. They had, all the kit was already there. Uh, all the cleaning gear, all the masks, everything was already in place. So we, uh, we were able to really just basically, and, and people were, were basically uh, knew what to do. And, we, and, and, you know, we have small viruses often, you know, like hand, foot, mouth and, and other things. So, so, so that really did help a lot. Um, what didn't, we, no one was prepared for, neither in Thailand nor in China was the kind of the shutdown of industry. Uh, it took, caught everyone by surprise. Uh, China had, you know, despite all the stimulus they started pumping into the system right after Chinese New Year, uh, managed to, to get caught with, uh, you know, a few tens of millions of workers unable to get home, uh, sorry, get from their Chinese holiday home back to their place of work. Uh, they weren't sick. They just couldn't cross provinces. And so if you had to take a train to, to cross two or three provinces, you just couldn't do that. And so industry for, for six weeks basically ground to a complete halt. Uh, Thailand's industry as well was not was not really uh, uh, prepared for it, and I, I recall like as uh, you know everything else was in already in lockdown. The only physical meetings I still attended at that time were meetings that had to do with uh, uh, the you know federation of industries had all these meetings about uh, business continuity under COVID. Those were the only ones that that I actually went to in person because we we still hadn't figured out Zoom and all the rest. And, and other things we could do by phone. This one, these were so important that you really need to have, you know, people in a room and, and there was space and everything. But, but it was still ironic that actually the business continuity ones were the ones that we actually had to have in person. Um, another one that, that I must say was quite impressed with is how the banks and security companies throughout the entire process didn't actually miss a beat. They, you know, these companies by law have to have people in the place of work. Um, and, and they managed to figure out, you know, safety measures. Everyone basically came up on their own initiatives to figure out how to do it. We did it as well. Uh, and, you know, we changed two or three times throughout the pandemic, uh, uh for our own employees. Uh, you know, first it was everyone, well, first it was Beijing office work from wherever they all are. They, everyone was home for Chinese in year. And, and we didn't get the entire office back together for three months. Uh, Bangkok office was work from home. Then it was work from my home when you know work from home didn't work and then and then we basically figured out would go back into the office in 18 and be, so so everyone was basically figuring things out um so that was the first stage when we were just kind of just figuring out what to do then the second stage came when we were we were hit with this new normal work from home school from home which was uh, crazy um you know uh we're in the business of doing cross-border m a it's very difficult to do that if you can't actually cross borders. I mean, people don't even buy a secondhand car without looking at it first. I mean, mergers and acquisitions by definition are secondhand companies. And we were finding that a little bit challenging. 
Um, and, and so it was figuring out what kind of new things that we, we could do. And also there was a lot of work and everything took three times longer uh, to, to get done. Uh, but we, we figured out, you know, how to get around that. But we also had a lot of other work kind of, you know, uh, getting masks for the Red Cross, things like that, things that, you know, I was able to do because of our connections in China. And, uh, and so on top of basically keeping, trying to keep everything, you know, afloat in the company, trying to keep our clients on board and, you know, that they didn't ditch us. And, uh, we also had you know, about three or four layers of, of, of other types of work that we had to do. So it ended up actually being a pretty, pretty busy year. Um, with all that, now we're thinking about what, what is going to happen with the next normal. Uh, the interesting thing I think with the next normal is is the, the, I, from from our perspective is the, the the key realization that given how expensive this crisis has cost the world, thirty trillion dollars, let's say, right, it will never ever be allowed to happen again. Forget forget about you know countries go to war for a billion dollars here or there, you know, uh, it, thirty trillion dollars is is really a tremendous amount of money and and if we think that we can just allow this to happen again it, it's not going to happen so what what does that mean uh if you have even the slightest uh risk of of some kind of bizarre uh virus spreading somewhere it's going to be a lockdown uh, regardless of whether that that virus is happening in china in the uk or in the us uh, if you look back, if you backtrace 20, for the last 20 years, um, we basically have one of these that could uh, could have basically turned into a uh, a COVID-19 every about three or four years. Count SARS, H1N1, H5N4, you know, pig flu, bird flu. Um, you know, every few years, one of something comes up, which uh, would going forward qualify for locking down some parts of the economy or some cities at least, you know, some canceling flights, canceling uh, um, uh, trains, uh, having people get, you know, developing rapid tests. Before you, the rapid test happens, you're going to have to figure out what to do with that. And, and so what then happens with that is things like, even for our company, we, we're now moving, we, we always, since, I founded the company 20 years ago. We always chose to be in these fancy office buildings. We're now thinking of moving out. It doesn't make sense to be to, for my team to be in a place where 20,000 people walk in and out of every day because because it, there's going to be tracing. If any one of these 20,000 comes in with any with a bug, our office is going to be shut for three months. You know, so so we're going to move to a place with less uh, concentration. We're going to move to a place with where we could effectively take care of ourselves. We don't need to rely on outside uh, for, 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 you know, the restaurants, the food, the food courts, food courts are the worst. Um, so, so that I think is going to be the, the reality of, of how, you know, business is going to be run. Uh, we're also going to be uh, impacted by, by, you know, things like air travel is going or automatically going to become more expensive. Uh, so we might end up in, in industries you know, like ours, where, where you actually have to have people on each side of the table, the way investment banking was in the 80s, when it was still expensive to fly. So in, in those days, these banks would actually have pretty sizable teams in each country and uh, wouldn't really be, and those teams basically could handle most of the deal all by themselves. In the 90s, when they started banking, uh, that had already changed to a hub and spoke model. So most of the the the, the Staff was in located in Hong Kong, Singapore, for Asia, and uh, and we'd then fly into Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, and all that, and, and most of the team would be flying in because of you know air flight was much cheaper then. Uh, so we might be returning to the 1980s. So in businesses like ours, we're going to be looking at at uh, putting together partnerships with firms that we trust, and and those will be the only countries in which we can do deals. So if we have partnerships in say UK, Spain. France, we can do those countries. We won't be able to do Germany um, uh, because we won't dare to do Germany because what if there's a bug? You know, 
somewhere along the line we can't you know travel to germany uh tourism is going to also change i believe uh, i think i think it's going to even after covid's gone uh there's always going to be the risk that by the time you book a flight six months six months from now that flight will be no longer be valid you know so people who book months in advance uh to catch the right day right up the school holidays that's gonna i think that's gonna change are you gonna go for longer to the city one place instead of three hotels are gonna probably have to become bigger the rooms are gonna because people are gonna instead of saying two nights you know people are gonna say two weeks and and it's gonna i think it's gonna change you know people are just gonna be closer closer to home by and large also working from home our experience with that was awful uh, it was basically ended up being not working from home uh very difficult we, we had no training at it we had no it no way to monitor and and uh, do things like that so i think going forward it's, it's going to be something like a fire drill people companies are going to have to and they're going to, there's going to be a whole industry on that but people are going to um, uh have to train on this you know at once a year training okay this is what we do work from home you cannot work from home in the same way as you work from the office and things like you know zoom meetings are are going to be are also going to you know, zoom meetings are going to more, more and more the norm well you know you more and more people are going to expect some things from zoom meetings we're going to fall into that kind of what is okay for a zoom meeting or what is not okay for a zoom meeting and and, and that's going to become the new norm so anyhow these are just a, a few of my thoughts on the on the, the new normal and the next normal and uh, welcome your thoughts for we'll your questions later Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, it's a very interesting perspective. Uh, I haven't decided yet whether it's a nice one or, or not so much. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, while we all think about it, uh, uh, let me uh, pass the button to Rahul. We'll uh, talk about uh, paradigm uh, shifts in economic policy. Rahul. Uh, thank you. And thanks to uh, all the folks at Trinity for making this happen. So um, as Andrew mentioned, my focus here will be on taking, as um, Andy so eloquently put it, the landscape of economics and economic policy in the US and projecting forward for what that means following the pandemic uh, as regards to a new normal for how economic policy is done, counter cyclical policy, particularly uh, in the midst of uh, future business cycles. And while I'll focus on the U.S., uh, that's my own experience, and uh, and in some sense where where the debate is fiercest right now, I think many of my observations will apply to global economic policy. So I'm going to call out three themes in particular that I think are some pretty dramatic shifts that are happening in real time. The first is um, what I'll call automaticity, um, and that refers to a broad debate happening about whether discretionary fiscal policy which heretofore has been uh, broken up into two pieces. There's the sort of discretionary fiscal action, the stimulus packages, for instance, that we've been debating and for a subset of cases legislating over the past 12 months. And then also automatic stabilizers, i.e. programs that function, uh, that, are, that are not discretionary programs, but that function as providing counter cyclical support in the event of a downturn, uh, because they uh, supplement income as income gradually uh, or in this case, suddenly declines over the course of a business cycle. So, so for instance, the progressivity of the tax code uh, is an automatic stabilizer. Um, programs that provide tax credits in the US uh, to low-income families is another example. Um, historically, these uh, initiatives have been bifurcated. They, re they represent separate arms of recovery policy in the US. But the uh, several features of the current environment are, are prompting a broader discussion about automaticity around fiscal policy. Um, one is uh, general volatility and uncertainty around the pandemic. You know, as Sandy mentioned, there's a big debate about uh, whether the $1.9 trillion bill that the Biden administration has put forth is too much. Uh, and if it is too much, how much wouldn't be too much, et cetera. Um, in some sense, having uh, tying spending in that bill to economic triggers would obviate much of that debate uh, because fundamentally the, the spending, if you index the spending to the business cycle, say to unemployment, uh, that spending would automatically retract as we approach full employment, and you would uh, you would sort of sidestep the fact that none of us have a clear analytical answer uh, for when you're like kind of blowing past potential output in terms of spending, uh, but you nonetheless provide adequate support for the economy. So I think there's a renewed debate in the context of that particular package 
Um, and if you look at, this is a sort of very rough math, but if you look at the components of the package, you know, roughly 25% of that is uh, spending that's geared towards the idiosyncratic recovery process around the crisis, public health spending, vaccine distribution, and so on. But the remaining 50 to 75% uh, are provisions that in principle you could automatize. Uh, for instance, uh, expanding the child tax credit uh, you know, uh, small business lending, et cetera, et cetera. Arguably even the, uh, the sort of much ballyhooed stimulus checks uh, that, that are about a fourth of the bill. So uh, there's a broader discussion about debt sustainability and automaticity is one way to get around that. Um, another is the fact that we now actually, as of uh, work being done over the last uh, 18 to 24 months, we now have triggers that uh, at least if the historical data is any indication, are reasonably high fidelity at uh, sort of indexing to recessions and indexing to the business cycle in real time. Uh, I'll point to one example of this uh, developed by a former colleague of mine, Claudia Sam, macroeconomist based in Washington. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, an economic trigger that she developed that's now being formally referred to as the Sam rule that's based fundamentally on short-term changes in unemployment Again, based on historical data, reasonably high fidelity, and in principle, you could design fiscal policy around triggers like the SOM rule uh, or, or sort of modified versions therein. So if we think about uh, kind of big picture, uh, there may be a world five years from now, 10 years from now, it doesn't look like that's going to be the case for this particular stimulus package uh, being uh, legislated, but wherein we think of, we think of sort of uh, fiscal policy inter inter uh, intervention in the context of a business cycle as fundamentally something that's more or less an autopilot with some modifications from policymakers, but a more robust set of auto uh, automatic stabilizers that, that are tied to these sort of one-off triggers uh, and that kick in in real time. That's, that's sort of point number one, or theme number one. Uh, the second theme I'll call out is uh, synchronicity. Uh, and that is the shift in discretionary, discretionary fiscal policy to what has historically been seen, you know, in Econ 101 textbooks, for instance, as being subject to quote unquote inside lag, namely the lag time that's involved with uh, having the requisite data to identify business cycle downturn of navigating political economy constraints to get stimulus legislation through. And then of course, having the administrative capabilities to administer large scale stimulus. Each of those three factors has historically meant that discretionary fiscal policy was delivered with a lag. In 2008, 2009, uh, between the, uh, the uh, sort of assumption of the Obama administration into office and the passing of the, of the uh, Recovery Act, it took about three months. Uh, but in the context of the CARES Act from last year, uh, between its initial conception at the start of the pandemic to passage, it took about one month. And we're even seeing, uh, you know, sort of uh, in the context of the current debate, the boundaries of how quickly Congress is able to coalesce around fairly large scale spending, uh, certainly incredibly large by historical standards, the largest uh, in the post-war period uh, in the US. Um, the political economy factor of that inside lag has, has dramatically shifted. In some sense, we've all become Keynesians in the trenches. But the other two factors have also shifted. Uh, for instance, on the data front, um, as we all know, uh, the national accounts data, the output data in the US, uh, is made available to policymakers um, with a significant lag. There are a series of revisions and you end up not getting uh, a complete picture of GDP in some cases until sort of many months after the quarter has passed. Um, in the context of the pandemic, that obviously became untenable. And we have now sort of an increasing panoply of private sector data sources that were informing policymakers in real time about labor market conditions, about output, and then of course about public health specific factors, for instance, traffic, uh, traffic conditions and sort of uh, human capital flows and so on. Um, what that means is the kind of, you know, sort of real time snapshot that policymakers uh, in the US and elsewhere didn't have just through your typical government surveys and national accounts uh, data is arguably, be, is arguably being uh, mitigated by these sort of real time private sector data sources that may, like I said, further facilitate more rapid intervention in the future. And then finally, the infrastructure that the treasury uh, and in particular the IRS has built around rapid dissemination of the stimulus checks, for instance, and in the most recent Biden administration uh, stimulus proposal around um, advanced payments for the child tax credit. Uh, and people are talking about a similar kind of advanced payment 
for advanced payment system for the earned income tax credit in the US means you get, you know, sort of an immediate cash infusion as opposed to the tax credit kicking in uh, when, when folks, when families file uh, a year later. All of that means you have a, a kind of broader stimulus response that, it, that is sort of more synchronized to the real, site, real, real time state of the economy. And then obviously with the discussion about automaticity I said a moment ago, that sort of further reinforces the, the kind of rapid response component to this. And I think is gonna fundamentally change how people think about the power of discretionary fiscal policy relative to monetary policy and other business cycle management tools. And the last thing I'll point out is the change in how uh, from a macroeconomic standpoint, I think uh, policymakers in Washington and, and elsewhere are thinking about, should be thinking about, will need to be thinking about uh, returns to scale for businesses. Uh, what we've seen uh, in, the, in the sort of shock related to the pandemic, and, and Joe touched on this in many ways, is how, for instance, um, IT, uh, and that's IT for remote work, that's IT for e-commerce e platforms, et cetera, has become in many ways uh, central in an accelerated way to how business is done. And, I, and IT spending is, in many ways, the classical example of a source of spending with uh, high-scale economies. Uh, you know, whether you're uh, a multi-billion-dollar business or uh, or a small uh, proprietorship, uh, software spending uh, scales uh, not sort of perfectly, invariably to size, but uh, but it's sort of much more fixed relative to other factors. And so, therefore, to the extent that uh, for instance, uh, operating effectively in a remote work environment means you need to make significant investments around uh, remote work software and technology infrastructure. It inherently advantages larger firms. And so the natural set point for what is the optimal firm size in the modern economy may have been nudged up pretty dramatically over the course of the last year. Um, and that, and, you know, in some sense, though, it's all sort of anecdotal and by proxy, we haven't seen M&A activity uh, slow down, uh, at least in the US and Europe. Um, you know, after the first sort of shock of the COVID in the first quarter or two, the last back half of 2020 was fairly active from mergers and acquisition standpoint, which was maybe in indicating this sort of broader push towards larger scale uh, that we're seeing. The other thing I'll call out is um, the differences in credit market availability between large and small firms. Um, you know, I think as both uh, uh, Sandy and Joe pointed out, um, equity markets and debt capital markets have both been incredibly robust in large part because of central bank, bank action over the last month. Uh, but arguably, the credit availability for small and medium-sized businesses hasn't been as robust. Um, in, for instance, the U.S., um, you know, the Fed took uh, significant criticism uh, because there was very limited take-up of their Main Street lending facility, um, and, and sort of the you know, surveys of bank loan officers indicated that credit conditions for small and medium-sized enterprises significantly tightened. So I think going forward, there's a broader discussion uh, and, in some sense, uh, reckoning to be had around how we should think about uh, business support policy in the context of this potentially steep and gradient around returns to scale between small and large businesses. So I'll stop there and uh, welcome questions and discussion. Thanks a lot, Raul. <clears throat> I think it's been a first uh, a very interesting uh, round with, with our panelists. Um, so as I mentioned, please, uh, um, Type your question in the in the chat function. I'll, I'll be happy to uh, ask pass your question on to uh, the panelists. Uh, I'm gonna start with a, with a question from uh, Theo Mills, who is uh, uh, wondering about the risks of inflation. I guess uh, Sandy has uh, briefly mentioned that in relation to the uh, Summers versus uh, Krugman debate. I mean, I've been following a little bit. Uh, Twitter recently, and, and a lot of uh, pundits have uh, pitched in with their views. I think Olivier Blanchard has also uh, written relatively extensively about it. Uh, so, so I'm curious to hear from from our panelists how they how they see the the risk of uh, of inflation, which I guess is really in relation to uh, the fiscal stimulus. Um, and I think this kind of fits into perhaps a slightly broader debate with. Uh, monetary policy uh, becoming more constrained uh, ever since the, the financial crisis, uh, the interest rate being close to the zero lower bound, uh, and a number of expansionary monetary policy measure coupled with uh, definitely more fiscal activism. I think this was definitely one of the biggest development of, uh, of the COVID crisis. Uh, so, I mean, the fear of, of inflation has, has been there, has been there for a while, in fact, since the Fed started QE. Uh, but we haven't seen much inflation uh, lately. 
Is it just uh, the ghost around the corner that never uh, shows up? Or is it something that we're finally going to see maybe in the next couple of years? What do you guys think? Um, actually, why don't we go in reverse order just uh, for a change? So, Raul, do you want to start this time? Sure. Sure. No, and, and uh, Andrea, as you mentioned, it's an incredibly timely debate happening. Um, let me just make two or three points on this. Um, the first is the, you know, the broader the broader debate about whether the package is large enough to trigger um, inflationary concerns hasn't yet shown up in market expectations. In particular, inflation expectations may be up, you know, 40, 50 basis points over the last month. Uh, Modest but still well below, you know, sort of meaningful but modest and still well below, uh, you know, the Fed's two percent inflation target. We have seen more of a uh, a nudge up, particularly in the last week, around long-term bond yields. So I think what may be happening is inflation expectations are so well anchored, uh, you know, the broader market is relatively convinced that federal uh, Federal Reserve central bank action can control inflation, and that you know, effectively, that's being priced in with. The increase in long-term yields that we're seeing. So, if if we take that at face value, and what the market is telling us is inflation will stay put, but we may be trading fiscal policy, the kind of the, the kind of impact of fiscal policy on the margin, uh, with the monetary response that offsets some of that fiscal policy action and and lets uh, long-term yields rise to as a corrective to control inflation. That maybe that's a good trade because, um, of course, the big debate over the last. Uh, 10, 15 years is how do we avoid um, a situation where we're, we, have, we have monetary policy stuck at the zero lower bound. And, and, and in effect, the market is telling us, at least based on these early signals, that, that this package may be helping us get past that. So um, I'm less concerned about the sort of inflation risk. I think broadly speaking, this is sort of aligned with the broader macroeconomic consensus, but, but let's wait and see because it's early. The other thing I'll call out is, um, you know, again, I think to the extent this, this ties back to the automaticity discussion, um, I'm not sure if we're, we'll get there in the current package, but to the extent that more and more of our uh, discretionary fiscal legislation is designed with that kind of uh, trigger trigger mechanism in mind, uh, we would essentially, I think, mitigate much of these concerns uh, because the uh, the flow of public stimulus would sort of naturally taper um, as we get closer to full employment and therefore um, sort of inflationary pressure. Thanks, uh, Joe. What's the view from uh, East Asia about inflation? Uh, well, Asia tends to get America, you know, the impact of America's inflation. So America prints and we actually get the tsunami. Uh, this time around, uh, uh, China has actually not seen very much uh, inflation problems uh, or no even expectations going forward. Um, uh, one reason I think is because just as China was uh, uh, getting into the COVID crisis was at the very moment that they were coming out of a cyclical downturn. Uh, they had gone through two, three years of, of kind of fixing the supply side, uh, where, where, and they also delevered well, or tried to delever the banks. But that had led to actually a sustained period of very uh, controlled M1 in the system. And M1 had been massively below M2, thereby sucking out a lot of the, the liquidity from the, from the corporate sector. And that actually led to, to when they started doing this uh, uh, stimulus, uh, they basically uh, put, M basically uh, M1 recovered to where it was pre, pre the uh, 2017, 2018 uh, supply side clampdown. Um, so now M1 is actually, uh, I'd say, if I'm not mistaken, probably just over 10% uh, in terms of growth. Um, and uh, inflation is about at zero now. Uh, we had a whole year of negative PPI uh, last year. Um, and for a while, it looked very scary because we had, on the one hand, a producer, negative producer price index and very high consumer price index as a result of uh, the ongoing trade war and the fact that they didn't buy, you know, uh, U.S. soy and U.S. pork, and, and and that actually led to the worst kind of inflation scenario for China, which is a high PP, uh, you know, negative PPI combined with very high uh, uh, CPI. But that has since uh, 
fix itself. And so now we're basically in a scenario where both PPI and CPI are at zero. And the, the, the expectation of having long-term inflation is not, is not particularly great. Uh, the also, to, to good to note would be that China went mostly for the fiscal stimulus and not the monetary stimulus. Uh, Route. So there was, you know, we see even in our Hutong in Beijing, uh, just a lot of doing stuff. We, you know, does this stuff effective end up producing more GDP down the line? Most likely not. It's you know making the the street look nicer, and uh, but you know there was a lot of that going on uh, all over China. Just uh, a lot of just building, building. It's it's the go-to method, but that that basically doesn't is isn't as doesn't create inflation as easily as you know a lot of money being printed and pushed down the system. The, the Chinese system is a lot more hermetically closed, so when you do that, you do you do end up getting a lot of inflation. So so the Chinese are quite wary of that. I mean, very few things uh, scare a reg, you know the 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 government more than than inflation. Pork prices, you know that that's the, you know can, that gets people on the street faster than anything. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Sandy, you were the one who actually brought up the Summers versus Krugman debate. Uh, what, what is your view? I mean, where, where do you stand at the end of the day in that debate? Uh, you're mute. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we can afford to err on the side of inflation right at the moment. I think I agree with Raul that um, that expectations are relatively well anchored at the moment. Uh, there have been, I guess, some uh, upticks in um, market expectations of an increase in inflation. But, uh, you know, we still have a fairly substantial output gap. Uh, a lot of people are indeed suffering. I'm, I'm hopeful that fiscal policy could be flexible enough that if the economy really starts to roar back, that uh, that expenditure could be could be cut back. So um, I suppose in that respect, I'm more on the Trugman side of the argument than on the Summers side of the argument, although I have great, well, I have great respect for both of them. And uh, reading Summers' piece in the uh, Washington Post was a very good op-ed piece, and it, it certainly made me think twice. Uh, but uh, in a word, I think we can afford some risk of inflation. Uh, it's very low right at the moment. I don't think it's going to accelerate drastically. Thanks. Uh, for what it's worth, I, I kind of uh, agree with that view. I mean, I would also note that the recent switch of the Fed to average inflation targeting, in some sense, uh, exactly built that tolerance in the direction of, of a bit more inflation. Uh, I mean, the other point is that it'd be kind of funny if after uh, 10 years struggling to keep uh, inflation uh, close to the target, it's finally fiscal policy that brings it back. Uh, I mean, kind of funny for, for the central banks. Um, okay, so, so I want to move on to, uh, to the next question. Sarah uh, um, uh, put a, a question in, in, in the chat, uh, which is uh, uh, related to something that Joe uh, uh, was talking about, uh, which is uh, about the, the change in the nature in which uh, business uh, will be uh, conducted, uh, sort of uh, uh, in, in a more somewhat maybe fragmented way compared to uh, how it was before. I mean, it, to me, it gave me a little bit, uh, or it raised whether there's a question about reversing a little bit the process of uh, globalization that instead we have experienced uh, for for such a long time, uh, so I'd be interested to see you know the the views of uh, uh, of the panelists. Uh, so why don't we start uh, straight with Joe if he wants to kind of further add some some points to what he said before, and then we go to Sandy and Ro. Uh I think we're actually already seeing uh, a trend among people who who decided to leave towns and 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 go and buy more suburban. Uh, houses, and and whilst uh, you know, Sandy mentioned that you know there's been increased cash, and and therefore the asset prices have have held up this year. But I think over the longer term, uh, we're going to see a, a, a tilt uh, in favor of uh, uh, smaller, you know, more more 
more you know standalone locations and at the expense of of larger concentrated um, buildings uh, regardless of whether it's uh, offices or uh, whether it's homes and and I think that that's uh, that's part of that's part of what we're going to have to come to expect and uh, and you know and it will it will impact it will impact people who own these big buildings but that's that's I think that that's going to be an and it might it might take the next COVID or the next kind of scare to to really hammer that home that point. But I think over the longer term, people are going to be and more f comfortable working in smaller places, and they are now able to, whereas they weren't before. They're able to do so now because of technology. They're able to do so now because of you know the the way that we are now getting used to working. It, it's not just technology, by the way. It's it's also what people have come to expect from you know, from their colleagues, from their their clients, from from you know the the people, the contractors. What ha what is the expectation? Most of the travel I used to travel 120 times a year. Uh, most of that was was really I because of the expectation that they wanted to see me there, not because I really was needed there. They you know they wanted to see they wanted to see that we cared about them and therefore the boss had to come and you know sit down have have lunch with them but that was basically my job just having lunch and, and, and dinner and and that is i think going to change people are not going to expect that anymore therefore we will be able to to work better in the way that we work and it's not just technology but the technology also helps <clears throat> thanks sandy what's your perspective on this um well you know i i do wonder if there's going to be a shakeout in the real estate market um you know you know, these large uh, high-tech firms have discovered that they can uh, have large, uh, a large share of their workforce working at home, apparently with no reduction in productivity, which presumably means they need less office space downtown and, and, and so forth. Um, I don't think that primary and secondary educational facilities, uh, physical facilities are gonna be affected because everyone seems to agree that in-person learning is essential at those levels. At the tertiary level, however, perhaps you'd be able to tell us more about this. It may be easier to uh, have more remote learning at the tertiary level. And, and that would have implications for the market for, you know, maybe Stanford will not buy that new building or Harvard will not buy that new building and so forth. I think that basically the pandemic is going to be having effects that will be sort of showing themselves over a period of some time. It's going to be a secular effect. It's not going to take place in one year or two years. It's going to take a long time to make itself, uh, to make itself shown. Thank you. Uh, Raul? Yeah, I'll just make a quick comment. I'm going to be slightly contrarian here, perhaps to my chagrin a year from now when I'm proven wrong. But um, one thing that we've seen the tech industry, which in many ways has been a bellwether of remote work and remote work adoption, is notwithstanding that uh, the tech industry is uniquely well suited to, to folks, you know, software engineers working from remote locations, they've all invested pretty significantly in um, effectively high cost office space in dense urban centers like San Francisco and New York City and what have you. Um, and so uh, and we can speculate as to why that is. Part of it is sort of how you attract employees in a competitive labor market, and maybe that's unique to the software industry. Um, maybe that has to do with some of the, the phenomena that uh, Joe and Sandy talked about, wherein you know you sort of ultimately need to locate folks in a, in a similar place, and having the amenities and the educational system of the city um, facilitate that, and so on and so forth. But to the extent that that's a useful bellwether for the broader economy, um, I'm a little bit more bullish on the resiliency of uh, sort of high-end corporate real estate and uh, sort of business-related real estate than, uh, than perhaps others might be. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's quite quite interesting. I mean, just, uh, you know, because uh, Sandy mentioned it, uh, my graduate students in particular are not too happy about remote learning. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that's the way we're going, at least for... For the graduate students, I don't. I, I haven't talked. I'm, I'm actually going to leave. From are those your graduate students or Oxford's graduate students in general? Uh, maybe it's your personality. Uh, I, no, no. <laughs> that's right. No, my graduate students. I meant the, the graduate students here in uh, in uh, who are doing the MPhil in economics. That's kind of a broad base. Uh, 
uh, feedback that we've been getting. And, you know, we may have been not terribly good in setting up our uh, remote learning, but I think we have experimented with so many alternatives and generally the reaction is uh, it's not so good. Uh, okay, so uh, there is a there is a, a comment actually from uh, Bernard Gersh, and given that it relates to his uh, uh, experience, I'm I'm kind of inclined to uh, ask him if he wants to make uh, the, the comment in person rather than than me uh, report. Yeah. What do you think, Bernard? Yeah, thank you very much. I'll just keep it brief. I'm um, actually a, a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in 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 Minnesota. And uh, it's been um, really amazing to see, I'm not even talking about the acute COVID response, and I've, I've actually been doing some studies with people in the UK as well, but in the post COVID world, there is no question that our practice is, and the way we practice is irrevocably changed. So I've been working at home for the last couple of months doing telemedicine consults, and part of that is uh, waiting for the vaccination before we could all travel. Um, managing all my um, clinical research and teaching on Zoom. And what I think has changed irrevocably is we all want to get back to face-to-face -face patient interactions. But in fact, we've learned some really good lessons. So this afternoon, I'm going to do six or seven electronic consults from other physicians within the Mayo Clinic and outside the Mayo Clinic. And of those six or seven patients, probably four or five can be handled by myself with that physician. And then two of those patients will have to come to the Mayo Clinic. Now, if they're coming to the Mayo Clinic, what we will do in advance, we will pre-schedule all their testing because they've already been seen. So instead of coming to Rochester, Minnesota for a week for their evaluation, they'll come in and leave the following day. And one of the reasons that spurred that was because of the high rates of COVID in, in the United States and in Minnesota, people were reluctant to come and travel and come to hospital or come to Mayo and spend three or four days there. So I, don't, I think that the telemedicine program is not going to go away. Uh, we will practice very differently. I think the big argument that we're having at the moment relates to travel and, and continuing medical education. How is that going to be a run in the future? I used to, in 2019, I went overseas 12 or 14 times to speak. Um, can we do all of that on Zoom? No. And you do miss the contact with colleagues and the camaraderie and many of the other aspects of these sort of big meetings. But we're working right now. I mean, we're one of the largest continuing medical education programs in the world. And we're working probably on a hybrid system where we may have um, a CME meeting in a, in a resort, once, you know, which we do quite often but at the same time have a hybrid situation where we will trans transmit it to India or, or places like that. But the, the effect on the way we practice medicine is going to be permanent. We are still trying to understand what changes will be permanent and what will be temporary, but, but it is going to be a different world. Thanks, Bernard. Um, that, that's very interesting. I mean, it kind of relates to one thing that we have uh, discussed here in terms of uh, delivering our material. So this kind of connects to what I was saying before, which perhaps one way, uh, you know, in this hybrid model is to deliver the more uh, standardized material via, uh, you know, videos pre-recorded uh, and then have, uh, you know, the more interactive part in person. And in that respect, I think Oxford with the tutorial system is, uh, has, has a very, uh, you know, uh, has a great advantage because it already has established this model, whereas perhaps other uh, universities will have to, to switch to, to this model. Uh, but, but it's certainly, uh, certainly very interesting. I don't know if any of the panelists want to uh, 
React. Yeah, uh, Joe. Yeah, and then yeah, and the specific uh, points re uh, regarding the uh, health uh, sector and the medical industry. Um, I have three points, uh, and you know, from from my experiences over the past year, I think uh, the first one is is uh, uh, com the very first thing that we uh, uh, focus on in Thailand was making sure we kept the health workers uh, healthy. Uh, the impact of, of uh, having uh, infected uh, healthcare workers was just devastating. And, and that, that's something that Thailand did very well. Uh, one of my clients, which was actually had nothing to do with the health sector, they were like uh, in uh, building materials and things like that. They, they kind of repurposed these uh, office, kind of mobile offices into, into places where the, the the nurses could be at a safe distance from the people checking that they were uh, swabbing for for COVID, and things like that, and and and, and it, which actually leads to the second thing, which is um, uh, you know having uh, the supply of protective gear and all the necessary things to actually protect the healthcare workers, uh, uh, sorted out. Uh, you know, have have having these reserves, and, and it was. What really shocked the, the, the Chinese was that they were the largest manufacturers of, of masks in the world and they couldn't manufacture them because the workers were out of time. They never thought of that scenario. And so now, you know, they're figuring out ways of getting around that, you know, that, you know, you, you can't be okay. You know, they were okay in any other time. Had a pandemic hit at any other time but Chinese New Year, they would have been fine. Mm. It just happened to hit at Chinese New Year and that crippled their manufacturing ability. They were short of masks and they had to very quickly scramble. And that was the very first thing they did was scramble to figure out how to get the key, you know, supplies to the hospitals to protect healthcare workers. And the third point is, uh, and again, it, it goes towards how to help protect healthcare workers is how to keep a, a safe distance between healthcare workers and the potential patients, people who may or may not be sick, uh, how to have the, you know, the, and they, that same client who, who built this uh, this uh, pod for for protecting the, the 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 nurses actually turned down an investment we brought to them a year earlier, which was for these little devices that could check uh, you know pulse oxygen level and all that just remotely, and they were like oh ah oh, yeah it's just a device, well that device really ha has been instrumental in in keeping a lot of patients basically away from from hospitals unnecessarily basically keeping them home. And we're, but keeping them home in a way that, where they're monitored live. And as soon as you know, the, uh, the, the heart rate uh, you know, shows some tremors or the, or the oxygen level dips, uh, it brings up an alert and you can, you can, you can react much, much more in a, in a much more timely manner. Thank One you. of the worst um, occupations in, in the UK was to be an anesthesiologist. I mean, the death rate amongst anesthesiologists yeah. is really really concerning i think over 40 anesthesiologists died sure. and um the other the other lesson that uh, i i think we learned was um we have a paper coming out in a u.s journal sadly the the senior author of that paper was one of the leading interventional cardiologists in england and a great friend of mine and uh, just after submitting the paper he died of COVID. Uh, in Leicester, but what it actually showed was during the COVID epidemic in the UK, people were frightened to go to hospital, and so they delayed. And in people with acute evolving heart attacks, the mortality went back to what it was 30 years ago. Mm. And now it's back up again to, to normal, but it wasn't because of the care that was being delivered. It was the sheer fear of going to hospital during an epidemic. And I think one of the lessons will be when the next epidemic comes as it will, is I, I think from a communication standpoint, people have got to be told, you know, you if you have symptoms, you must go to hospital. We will take care of you when you get to hospital. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's perhaps something that went a little bit under the radar, but it's uh, definitely, definitely important. I think Sandy also wanted to add uh, something in response to well, your original uh, answer. Just, just, just very briefly, from the point of view of a patient, uh, telemedicine uh, can be a real time saver. 
I've had uh, you know various appointments recently, and and uh, they were just as good as in-person uh, appointments, and I didn't have to go to the office of the hospital. Uh, you know, tele telemedicine is another area that's going to be irrevocably changed. By, by the yeah, and I think the technology gets better and better, so you can do a video consult. I actually live in Jackson Hole, which is as scary as what it hurt myself and got all the x-rays here, but I wasn't going to get treated here. I was going to get treated at the Mayo Clinic and everything was done um, through Zoom. It was great. But there are other things that, that you can't do. And that's what we're still trying to work out, what, what can be done and what should be done and what still has to be done face to face. Raul, let me ask you a question, which is uh, uh, related to this, and it was uh, Sue's question. What, what do you think uh, uh, economic, uh, or more generally, uh, policy government should do in terms of, of policies uh, to, uh, uh, to minimize uh, the, the risk of pandemics in the future and, and the damage of, of pandemics? Well, one of those actually, uh, to your point, Andrea, relates to the conversation we're just having around telehealth, um, wherein one of the challenges over the past year to the healthcare delivery system, and this is admittedly a very US-centric problem, is the way our delivery system is financed makes it uniquely susceptible to uh, slowdowns of healthcare utilization, namely in a fee-for-service construct. If patients aren't coming through the door, you have a financial problem all of a sudden, um, as whether you're a hospital or a medical practice. And uh, it just so happens that uh, one of the answers to that uh, also happens to be a solution to a broader delivery system challenge in the US around aligning incentives uh, to manage total cost of care. Um, and so shifting to a system where we have um, at least primary care services delivered uh, on a capitated basis, not unlike the, the budgeting um, conducted under the, uh, the NHS trust um, would both build financial resiliency in our delivery system, but also, as I say, align incentives toward value. So one of that's just sort of priming the delivery system that way, Andrea. Um, the other thing I'll call out is um, the, uh, you know, I, I think broadly speaking, one of the challenges uh, in managing the pandemic, and uh, this is true of many countries, but uh, US is uh, particularly, uh, it's particularly salient in the US, is the fact that we, we have effectively an under-digitized and a digitally fragmented delivery system uh, because of uh, actually a provision in the Affordable Care, uh, it, rather in the Recovery Act passed under uh, President Obama, um, we've seen a fairly rapid adoption of electronic medical records in the US um, really since 2000, 2009, 2010. Uh, but those records uh, fundamentally for the most part don't talk to each other. So um, in fact, uh, policymakers, whether they're at the Centers for Medicare, Medicaid Services, or other parts of uh, our government in Washington, or in state governments, really have no easy way of extracting en masse uh, medical records to monitor uh, the pandemic or future pandemics, uh, because these records are, to a large part, interoperable. So, so the one problem is sort of this fragmentation. And then the second is there are parts of the delivery system that are under-digitized. In fact, if you look at the post-acute care side of the delivery system, think nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, um, et cetera, uh, there you see adoption rates of electronic medical records that are actually much lower than they are for hospitals and for physician offices. So for instance, skilled nursing facilities, which are in some ways the most sophisticated um, uh, of the various post-acute care facilities in the US delivery system, post-acute care meaning facilities where patients are typically discharged after they leave hospital to facilitate recovery. Uh, EMR adoption, most latest data suggests EMR adoption was in the kind of 50 to 60, 50 to 60 percent range, which says over half of skilled, or you know, roughly half of skilled nursing facilities uh, don't have any kind of electronic medical record, which obviously makes uh, pandemic surveillance incredibly challenging. So I think that element of digital infrastructure investment uh, will be key for future preparedness. Thanks a lot. Um, I want to get to a question by, by Fiona Shen, who uh, is uh, wondering about the rise in income inequality. So, so Sandy mentioned income inequality among uh, households, Rahul mentioned in terms of, for, for businesses in terms of access to external finances. Uh, what kind of measures do you see, you know, uh, can be put in place to, 
sort of uh, mitigate this rise in inequality, which was clearly, you know, a, an issue already pre-COVID. We know that there's been a lot of discussion about the connection between inequality, rise of populism, uh, you know, uh, some, some of the, the political outcomes that we've seen in the last uh, five to 10 years. So, uh, you know, I, you know I, I suspect probably the question would, uh, is alluding to the fact is something that is going to stay on, on the table as part of the debate. It's probably not going to go away as a result of kind of uh, long run trends. And so, uh, you know, are we going in the direction of, of putting in place something substantial to, to sort of fight this, this inequality and what, what can it be? Uh, so maybe Raul, do you want, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I, I agree with the thrust of the question, incredibly important. I, and I also agree with you, Andrea, that the, we don't see this issue going away anytime soon. Um, I think the, the good news in some ways is many of the uh, policy interventions that, for instance, are part of this uh, stimulus package being debated have dual function, both in providing immediate stimulus, but also helping to counteract income inequality going forward. So take, for instance, the Biden administration's fairly dramatic expansion of the child tax credit. Um, this is uh, effectively converting what is um, what is a key source of support for families with children is something that's much more like a child allowance. Um, you know, that, that has a fairly dramatic effect. I mean, we have a variety of think tanks in the US, the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, perhaps being the most uh, notable example that have done distributional analyses of what does that change to the tax credit mean in terms of income inequality? Uh, and needless to say, it's actually quite significant. And so that coupled with many of the other provisions we're talking about, for instance, expanding automatic stabilizers, would play a dual hat role in also addressing income inequality. Um, the, business in, the business inequality problem, I think, is much more um, challenging to think through. Um, and I, I would, I'll say up front, no easy answers um, to that question. I think one more narrow technical response that I'm giving a lot of thought to these days, uh, as, as are many others, is this question of that kind of credit availability that I alluded to earlier. Um, you know, it, are there, for instance, mechanisms that we should have in place uh, wherein uh, that, that sort of address the limitations that small businesses have in, in sort of accessing uh, debt capital markets, accessing bank credit in the event of a downturn? Uh, banks, uh, you know, sort of core to the business model for banks is a portfolio effect wherein, you know, they're lending into a very broad, diverse group of businesses within a region. Um, and so if, if any one subsector of those businesses or a subset of those businesses struggles, maybe others do well. And so in aggregate, you're reducing risk across the portfolio. But as you go into a business cycle downturn, that portfolio effect is no longer an effective diversification tool. And sort of thinking through um, in the US, whether it's credit guarantees or risk sharing mechanisms uh, with banks, how can we sort of maintain the flow of credit that larger businesses have through the public markets. I think that's going to be very key, but no, no sort of immediate answers there. I'll make a comment about the states. There's some really <coughs> nice work done in the UK about 10 years ago showing that it's not just socioeconomic status that determines health, but it is inequality. In other words, uh, it's not just enough to be poor to have bad outcomes, but being poor in a sea of plenty is an added risk factor. Now, what has happened in the US over the last 20 years in terms of health inequalities is, is very disturbing. I mean, hugely disturbing. If you look at what happens between West Virginia and Mississippi, the so-called stroke belt in the Southeast United States, mortality rates, stroke rates, everything is much, much higher. And, it, and the disparity is increasing. So everybody recognizes from all the medical societies and they now say that socioeconomic status is almost as important uh, as many of the objective measures of health. But how do you correct that? And I don't think we, I don't, I don't know. We recognize it, but it's like we live in three different worlds in this country. And we also don't have a health system, as you pointed out, Raul, it's so fragmented. 
Yeah, there's a, there's a book by Angus Deaton and Anne Case that's called Death of Despair that, that illustrates these issues in the US. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's incredibly interesting. It's also uh, very sad, I think, uh, but it goes uh, exactly along the lines that, that you're describing. <laughs> Sandy, what do you think about the, the issue of inequality? I, I would add that uh, Deaton and Case wrote an article in Foreign Affairs that was kind of a precy of the book, and it was, it was very interesting and depressing. Um, I'm wondering, I'll just, you know, uh, rather than repeat what the others uh, have said, could the US benefit from a better apprenticeship system? You know, there's this emphasis in the US about reducing inequality by everyone getting a degree, a college degree, a community college degree or whatever, degree, 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 degree. But I think people look down their noses at, you know, honest working men who, you know, maybe aren't gonna go to college, uh, but, you know, still benefit from a decent wage or salary. And I'm wondering if the US couldn't somehow adopt the kind of system that I understand exists in Germany, for example. Um, I don't know much about it, but um, I wondered if this, is, it's obviously not a short term solution, but I wondered if it might not be part of the solution. Um, I think the increase in minimum wages, if it's not too great, would be part of a solution. And I think a tilt and the progressivity of the income tax, such as Raul was, was, was mentioning, would be part of it as well. So I think it's really a combination of structural measures and perhaps more short-term measures that, that, that might help. Um, but you know, the, the, it's also all tied up with the, the, the problem of racial inequality in this country. And uh, you, have to, you have to get a handle or do something about that at the same time. Uh, the only part of, the US social safety net that is at all generous is social security, the retirement benefit. Everything else is just skimpy, as skimpy as can be. And, and, and that simply can't help. And I think indirectly it's a legacy of the country's racial uh, uh, problem. So Joe, I wanted to ask related to, to inequality. Yeah, when, when uh, a while ago before, well before the financial crisis, I guess, uh, so, some people were describing inequality as a sort of a byproduct of, of growth. I, I think now that the view has, has shifted a lot, uh, but I'm wondering whether in countries like Southeast Asia, where growth is much higher uh, than, than it is in Western economies now, uh, China would be the, the quintessential example, I guess. Uh, what, what, what is the view about, about inequality? Is it, is it something that now with, with the shift to more like a market-based economy and high growth rate, something that becomes uh, more tolerated or, or is still something that the government is actually actively trying to, uh, to avoid much more so than it has been in the past in, in, in Western economies? Personally, I, I think uh, it's it's a false tautology. I mean, I think we've been led to believe that oh, it's it's okay. It's you know, there's all this inequality because we're growing. That's fine. I, I don't actually agree with that. I think you know the inequality is there because it's there. And, and you know, Sandy and Rahul touched on the reasons what, what you know why and what we have to do to fix it. Uh, they're all there. We're just not doing it. I you know we have high growth in Asia. We have lower inequality than in a, a lot of you know Western countries, which which you know shouldn't be having that high inequality. We have uh, higher inequality now than we had before in both Thailand and China. Uh, but, you know, we, the, the social safety net is still there. And the situation is improving for uh, the, the lowest uh, social uh, income earners. And therefore, I think that that kind of has kept a lid on on the pressures of social inequality. So for example, I'll give two examples, one in Thailand and one in China. Um, uh, in China, it's, uh, over the last 15, 20 years, I've been going back to the same villages in Southern China where, where we have that uh, children's project. And you know, the, the, these people have, their lives have, has improved drastically over the last 15 years. 15 years ago, it would take four or five hours to get from the airport to these villages, now it takes hour and a half 
the roads go right up to the village, uh, which makes a huge difference. They can sell their crop at much higher prices. And, and um, you know, when we started the project, we were having to subsidize uh, uh, food for the, for the children so that they would eat meat at least once a week because they, they were eating it twice a year. Uh, we actually withdrew that subsidy about you know, five, six years after, after we started it because there was no need. They were eating meat on their own. And similarly, we used to have primary school grants. We also got rid of that. Now we're doing university grants, things like that. So, so the situation for the lowest income earners has improved very drastically. So that has helped despite the fact that there's been increased uh, inequality over time. Uh, on, on the second example, I will uh, outline that one of the safety nets that actually helped Thailand uh, in, in this whole uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, Thailand, uh, you, as you may or may not know, actually has done very well in, in the COVID pandemic. And this, despite the fact they know, it, you know again, it's a lot of false uh, tautologies, uh, which have been, you know, People have been led to believe, oh, we, we can't, you know, have lockdown because we're a democracy. Oh, we can't, you know, do tracing because we're a democracy. You ended up having to do both. You know, it's just wasted six months. Um, what Thailand did very early on, uh, which is one of the reasons why, you know, Thailand had one death per million uh, from, from, you know, uh, from COVID, uh, is that uh, they, we had the safe, safety net set up in the 90s, which were called health volunteers. Uh, set up by this doctor in the early 90s. Uh, and by, you know, at this point, there were over a million of these health volunteers and they're in every single village. So that actually helped the government. And this is an entirely volunteer system. They tend to be retired people and, and you know, and they, they were able to monitor and, and enforce quarantines, for example, of people uh, during the whole uh, COVID crisis. So which led to actually very few people uh, uh, contracting the disease to begin with, and those that contracted the disease actually being treated very quickly. So our death per, per million population is a third of China's, which, which already is a good, has done very well. Our death per million is a third of China's and our death per COVID case is a 10th of China's. So, so you know, uh, and, and that has been because of the safety net that was set up you know, 10, 15 governments ago, but that has kind of run its course. And Thailand's hard, what we, in both countries, the, the hardest sec segment that we've had to, to, to help out in the COVID times were actually the informal sector. And th these guys were the ones that have actually fallen through the cracks. So if you ask about the, the uh, situation with uh, inequality after COVID, it's actually got a lot worse because we've been unable to help uh, the informal sector. The, the, the unemployment benefits Sandy mentioned in the US, there was a big uptake in, in, in unemployment benefits. There were very few um, uptakes in unemployment benefits in China because the benefits only benefit people from that same province in that province. So if you cross provinces to work, you don't count. And therefore you are not eligible for unemployment benefits and things like that. So, so the, the whole system is, it has, has yet to be uh, tweaked in order to cater to, to really the informal sector. Uh, the flip side, though, is we've actually had a lot of informal sector help as well. So, you know, people just chipping in and, and helping out, and, you know, food, my, my wife uh, uh, basically ran a, a food uh, program where every day they'd have like 200 meals. And within two days, I had to increase it to 500 meals a day. And it, it was taken up every day. Um, and the, the, everyone basically chipped in in an informal way. And that actually helped a lot. And it helped precisely the informal sector, which was which fell through the cracks. Thanks. So we are uh, approaching the end, um, but I think there was one more question uh, from uh, Theo Mills, uh, which I think could be helpful to sort of wrap it up. So, so the question is really about the difference in the policy response between uh, advanced economies and emerging market economies. I'm going to just uh, widen the scope of that question a little bit and, and sort of make a consideration. We've seen a big heterogeneity uh, uh, across uh, you know, the response to the pandemic in terms of uh, health measures, in terms of economic policy measures. Certainly, you know, uh, as the question points out, between emerging markets and, and advanced economies, but also within each group. And so what I want to ask the panel to sort of uh, quickly, maybe one, two minutes at most, around is 
what they see as kind of the ideal model, if we can identify one, to deal what Joe pointed out is the possibility that you know another pandemic will come. And so, so here, I don't want to hear just uh, you know what you think is going to happen. I would like to hear really your personal view of what we learn and sort of what is if you could pick uh, the best model. Uh, so, uh, Sandy, do you want to go first? Um, sure, I'd be glad to. I, I think I would uh, not do uh, what the Trump administration did. That would be my model, rather my anti-model. I mean, quite seriously, forgive me for saying this, but I don't know whether uh, Trump could be legally indicted for mass murder, but he is effectively guilty of mass murder uh, through his condoning of a policy of disregarding uh, masking, his mocking of people wearing masks, uh, a totally inadequate response uh, in, in the production of personal protective equipment uh, and so forth. Um, I think that I mean, obviously the response, I'll try to be as quick as I can, is going to depend on how open and democratic a country is. The United States could not have done what China did. Uh, the United States is also a federation and there has to be some variation uh, in response across the country. But the fact is, is that Republican governors slavishly followed uh, Trump's model. And if Joe Biden or anybody else, I think if Hillary Clinton had been president at the time, we'd have tens of thousands fewer deaths than we had. Uh, Thanks. Uh, Raul? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is gonna sound a little bit like a bromide, but but a lot of it is um, having, as, as Sandy mentioned, the political leadership that uh, is responsive uh, in a technocratic sense to, to sort of the changing base of evidence, uh, both drawing from past experiences for how to manage pandemics, but also responding in real time to what we're learning about any particular virus going forward. So part of it's just having the right ethos uh, of evidence-based policymaking and administration at the top. Um, and then I think part of it is also you know, uh, reinstituting re a sense of multilateral uh, global coordination, which I understand in the broader geopolitical discussion is, uh, has yeah. somewhat fallen out of vogue in certain, in certain parts of the world. But, you know, if you look at, for, if you contrast what's happened with COVID-19 with the Ebola response uh, a few years back, night and day, and the latter was, uh, the latter, the, sort of the effective response and management of the latter led by uh, the U.S. in particular, uh, was facilitated by global cooperation, wherein what we have here is, you know, sort of allegations about countries uh, holding back data, uh, particularly around China. Um, we have obviously U.S. leadership uh, under the Trump administration reluctant to work with the World Health Organization, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that just gets in the way of uh, something that knows no borders. Uh, that, that's a global, a global human problem. Not Thanks. Uh, so, last but not least. Uh, I, I would, you know, uh, fully agree with both Sani and Rahul's uh, points. I would like to add one point to that, and I, and that is education. I think, uh, you know, the reason why Asian countries uh, uh, handled uh, the COVID crisis better than Western countries, and and this, regardless of whether they're auto autocratic or democratic, right, rich or poor, you know, uh, they all did better, and the reason being uh, because. It, we were better prepared, not the government necessarily, the people. And we were better prepared uh, because we had more practice at it. And, and uh, I think, uh, and also we had better information. We had, we had, we had that science-based uh, policy making. We had the science-based kind of, people believed in, in that we had to wear a mask but because they, they knew it, they knew it. And it was, it was education. And I think that that's something that we can do to really help next time around. Uh, the interesting thing is all these countries, be it New Zealand, uh, Taiwan, uh, you know, uh, Thailand, uh, China, Korea, Japan, they all, all these countries took different approaches. They, they all different approaches. They all basically ended up at the same place, which is a well-managed uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and, and they did sooner what they knew was inev inevitable, closing down airports, uh, checking, tracing, testing, masks, uh, uh, confinement, uh, lockdowns, uh, quarantines, you name it. Uh, they, they basically knew it was necessary because they had been educated. So that would be my point. 
Thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, so I think it's uh, uh, just one minute past seven, so, so it's time to uh, wrap it up. I thought it was uh, an amazing panel. I was really happy to uh, being asked to, to chair it. I, I, I definitely learned a lot. Uh, I would like to thank uh, a lot the panelists and all the participants for uh, attending, uh, presenting, uh, discussing and asking so many uh, interesting and, and relevant questions. So uh, well done, uh, everybody. Um, I just uh, a final point, uh, a reminder that uh, next week we'll have uh, the final uh, talk uh, in the series, which will be about climate change and energy. So I hope that many of you uh, will be able to participate and make it uh, another successful event.